I have been in, I, what, number three or four yeah. uh, uh, in, in Alcala, and it was a nice place to meet, and I recommend that everybody go there. Tonight is, uh, it's my extreme privilege and honor to introduce uh, to you the next speaker who is going to be our keynote speaker, Dr. Kaveh Madani. Uh, Kaveh Madani uh, is a globally recognized environmental scientist, educator, and activist who has been working at the interface of science, policy, and society. Uh, Professor Madani is now the director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health uh, since February 2023. So that's basically two months ago. The institute is one of the 13 UN University Institute located in 12 countries that contribute to effort to resolve the the pressing global problems of human survival, development, and welfare that are the concern of the United Nations, the people, its people, and its member states. The Institute contributes to the uh, resolution of pressing global water challenges by synthesizing uh, existing scientific knowledge, conducting cutting edge research, identify emerging policy issues, and developing on the ground uh, scalable solutions. Do Dr. Madani is also a research professor at the City College of New York and affiliated with the CUNY Chris Institute. Uh, prior to, to this, he has held position at Imperial College of London, Henry Hart Rice Senior Fellow at the Yale University uh, Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Uh, Dr. Madani has uh, over 15 years of interdisciplinary research and policy-making experience in water management, climate, ch climate change, and environmental justice. He has held high-level policy-making experiences, including the Vice Presidency of the United Nations Environmental Assembly, uh, uh, overseeing the global high-level decision-making body on the environment. He has also been involved in the negotiation over the implementation of the Paris Agreement uh, as a lead negotiator and, and head of delegations. Uh, he has served as PI and co-PI of many grants and uh, research projects funded by NSF, EPA, NOAA, and the European Union, more than $20 million of those grants. Uh, he works at the interface of science, policy, and society and has held academic position in, in natural uh, sciences, social science and engineering departments uh, at the world leading institution. Uh, he has authored more than 160 articles uh, in referee journals and confer uh, conference proceeding and has uh, supervised more than 50 master, PhD and postdoctoral uh, scholars. Uh, he uh, had his master's degree in civil engineering from University of Tabriz in Tehran, in Iran, and a master of water uh, resources degree from Lund University in Sweden, and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from University of California in Aves. Please uh, come to the podium. It's uh, my honor to introduce him. Thank you for such a very, you know, generous um, introduction. I, I got worried, like, you have too much information about me. I don't think my wife can, you know, describe me with so much detail. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's it's a, an honor and, and pleasure to be here, and, and thank you so much for um, for the invitation. As Reza said, um, I'm now the, the director of the um, the United Nations Univer um, University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, which is known as the uh, United Nations Water Think Tank. Is this going to come up? Um, <coughs> so, so, you know, um, I, I would like to use this opportunity um, to talk about water. Uh, not long ago, back in March, uh, this city uh, saw the, uh, I think, the biggest event of our time on, on water. After 40, almost 47 years, 46, 47 years, the world got together to again talk about water. Um, believe it or not, uh, water is a very overlooked subject and something that we don't um, talk about much at the global level and in policy circles. You know that um, the United Nations has a lot of 
um, agencies dedicated to different topics, different resources, including food, FAO, health, WHO, uh, environment, UNEP, but there is no organization of that um, kind for water. Um, so we are increasingly seeing that water, you know, water is uh, becoming more and more important because we, um, we now are failing big time in, in many places in the world. Um, those of you who are f uh, from Spain, you appreciate the value of water and you know why water matters. I, I grew up in Iran, I also understand why it matters. And, and, but the, the, glo the problem is a, is a global problem. And I think it's just a good chance um, for us to review what is happening and how these issues are interlinked and interdependent and, and very, very much hard or maybe impossible um, to solve. So at the global level, we are dealing with the problem of water bankruptcy. Our, our demand is much more than the available water. And, and remember this term from me. We started with our chicken account, surface water, and use the water um, uh, to the extent possible. We, we divert the water, we build dams. Um, the chicken account you know, um, that gets renewed every year is not sufficient to meet our demand. We've gone also after, after um, our saving accounts, the, the water that we inherited from our ancestors, groundwater. We have overused groundwater. We're seeing the overdraft of groundwater all over the world, many places. And, and with that, it comes land subsidence, um, sinkholes, and many other problems that are, are, are reverse, irreversible. And yet, we don't have any plan for fixing this because water is very much tied to everything, including food. Uh, which is one of the most important resources. The most important product of the water sector, let's say, is is probably uh, um, food, at least, and, and and you know one of the most essential products, I would say. And, and food must be kept cheap um, or affordable globally. Otherwise, there are other issues that you know human insecurity problems. So that that makes water management even uh, maybe harder. Um, than some other sectors compared to energy sector, where there is no incentive really to, to um, operate this sector economically because the finan financial side of it doesn't make sense. The equations um, don't, don't make sense. So what is happening is that not only we are having problems with la lack of access um, to water in, in many parts of the world, but, but the, the conditions of, of you know, uh, water shortages is, is getting worse and worse. Um, we are changing our diet globally. Um, um, the, the poor um, of the world are eating, the, you know, having the diet that the rich of the world are, are promoting at the moment. Uh, we're, we're, we want everyone to go vegan for their health and for, uh, for, the, for the planet Earth. Uh, but, but we have the people who are converting uh, from from um, more environmental friendly diets to less environmental friendly diets, and then that's a maybe part of the human development uh, path that we have created. And with with more meat consumption, we know that we need more water. And our energy consumption keeps going up around the world. We keep talking about addition of renewables to our energy supply portfolio, but at the same time, we're increasing consumption. Um, the experience of, of Germany this year is showing us or is pre proving to us that reduced consumption is also possible under real pressure, but that pressure doesn't exist, so we continue to grow the energy demand, um, at, at the energy sector, and energy supply portfolio, and uh, consumption keeps increasing. That means there is more demand for water because energy production is also consuming a lot of water. So if you look at what is happening around, we're seeing lakes drawing up. We see reservoirs hitting their, you know, um, um, essentially uh, day zero. We are seeing all the manipulations of, of the uh, water-based ecosystems around the world. Anthropogenic changes are visible anywhere we, we take a look at. Our urbanization is continuing with, it, with, with very fast. We are channelizing rivers. We are tweak, tweaking and, and intervening with, with natural processes, and, and we're creating problems. Down the road, uh, you know, upstream and downstream, we also have, we have problems because the way we get affected by water problems um, is, is different. All of us get affected differently, maybe the rich of the world. We never feel that you know, shortage of water from the tap, but in parts of the world, 
children skip school for for going and grabbing water. Women have to spend hours and, and walk for miles and kilometers to, to bring water to their home for cooking, for sanitation. So the basic needs are, are missing in, in a lot of places and the pressure and, 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 and uh, the cost is higher to those who have the least capacity to cope with the problem. That is you know, something that we are increasingly now talking about, the, the justice element. But this is a very, very unjust um, equation. And I think, you know, we talked about the pandemic. Um, so the pandemic, I think, proved to us how this issue of injustice can play a major role. The poor of the world got vaccinated later. They had more losses, more people died. No one cared about it. Even the rich nations were fighting over vaccines, masks, and, and so on. And at the point that the poor needed the help, there was no one there to help them. Uh, farmers rely on water for their livelihood. 70% of the world's water goes to the agricultural sector to produce food, that cheap product that I talked about. Farmers are like, you know, the most important stakeholder or the most important group when it comes to water management. Uh, they control 70% of the water. Now, uh, that water is their life. Water is their livelihood. Um, not only they, they farm to, to eat food, but also to, to make a living. And if there is no water, there is no job, there is no income, and, and lots of other things can happen. This is a group of people for which we have no real plans. This is a political economy problem for countries to address this, this, this issue. Not only we have to think about food security and food production and food supply chains around the world, but also about like other alternative jobs and alternative modes of livelihood for these people. And the, the poor economies can't afford actually switching, moving the pressure from, from the agriculture and farming sector to other sectors and creating jobs in industry, service, and other sectors because they're poor. The gap is there and they, don't have, they can't cope uh, with this situation. So when they lose life, they have to migrate. When they migrate, their living conditions will change. We see more inequalities. We see marginalized societies and communities. And, and with that, we see wars, conflicts, and, and many other things, more tension uh, as a result of that. If you look at the way we consume water around the world, we also see a lot of inequalities. The way, and you know, um, this is how, uh, if, if we change the size of the country, you know, the, the countries, um, According to their water use, look what happens to Africa and South America. And look like how big North America is, how big Europe is, and how big some other populated areas of the world are. Um, why is that? Because our, our, you know, our, our lifestyles are, are different. The rich can't afford using and wasting more water. And that's, that's another inequality. And where do, they, where do we use the, most of this water? Um, the rich end up using more of this water either in their domestic sector or, or their, their industrial um, sector. Now let's switch to the food side and see when it comes to agricultural water use what happens. The, the map looks a little different. Again, the poor and some emerging economies are the food providers to the world. They're supplying food to us. They're giving food to us. We saw this year, what, you know, what, with recently, what happened with, with um, the Russian invasion, right? How, how the invasion of Ukraine affected food supply chains around the world. Again, the rich afforded it, they could come up with some solutions, maybe the price went up and, and there was a solution. But there are countries that are suffering from hunger, people, nations suffering from hunger just because of this um, sort of perturbation of, of the food supply chain. So essentially, we sell technology and service to the rest of the world and, and buy cheap food from them, which that cheap food we're importing there their resources, and then that's that's pretty much about a lot of other things. And we don't pay the, the you know we don't really pay the full cost of what you know not labor, not 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 resources, and so on. And it's it's a very unjust situation. As a result of this, we are seeing what is happening to the ecosystem. Uh, wetlands and lakes going dry. This is a face famous Lake Rumi in northwest Iran. Similar story of Salt Salt Lake. Um, in, 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 you know, in Utah, 
or or RLC and and um, you know in the Soviet. So similar story again, m increased consumption upstream and then a lake and a wetland that goes dry. This was one of the largest hypersaline lakes in in the world. Um, ecosystem gets affected, and now we are dealing with a problem that uh, will be one of the major problems of the 21st century, environmental problems of the 21st century, that yet we don't even speak about, and that's dust storms. This country, we have seen you know, dust storms in the previous century, very big, you know, even force people out of out of places, migration, and and change of business and land use. But but unfortunately, in many many places, the the socioeconomic context is such that that such a change is not feasible. So people have to stay in, in areas with, and, and they get exposed to dust storms. And I have been, I have experienced dust episodes when the dust when the dust comes. Um, not only you, you get affected, you know, health-wise, that's that's true, but but these dust particles can can shut down electricity grids when they sit sit on on, on the, the the grid. Um, as a result of power outage, then you you can get water outage, so stop water utilities stop functioning. So then you have a a, a city that is shut down and, and no function. There is no function, and dust is all over the place. And it's not easy to move people from one location to another in these um, situations. We increasingly also talk about wars and conflicts as a result of a water shortage, water bankruptcy, and 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 these things. Um, we we you know some go so far that they they even think that drought is the cause of the Syrian uh, crisis. I don't think that it is true, uh, but yes, drought is a catalyst. And when farmers lose job, any any government anywhere in the world gets frustrated and nervous because revolutions can happen and and uh, chaos can 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 come now. Climate change here has a major role as well. The question is what, what role it has, like how much climate change is contributing to this. If you talk to, um, to a lot of decision makers, actually climate change is a way to, um, you know, is a good excuse to, to not to be accountable because you can blame all these problems on climate change and simply say that the lake went dry, the river dried up, and we have no water because of climate change. Unfortunately, this is a situation that we are we are seeing. And on, on the other side, some of us in climate sciences, we take any we use any opportunity um, to get attention to climate change. So we see somewhere going dry, a lake that is, is going dry, a lake that has dried up. We immediately climatize the the situation and the problem to get attention to climate change and call for action. And as a result, again. We are not really helpful because we're not we're you know uh, missing the real cause. So what happens is is I I think it is very important for us if we want to address water problems and other problems related to to the environment and sustainability of humans and human security. We have to also understand the role. So climate change in a lot of cases serves at a as a catalyst. It's, it's exacerbating the situation. It's speeding off the processes, but. But if you look at the water problems around the world, you see that the anthropogenic changes at the local level, changes in land use, you know, land use policies, development, and so on, are 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 very effective and have a huge influence on what is happening. And you, if you miss that part of the equation, then you cannot really come up with uh, with uh, the the right explanation. Uh, of the problem and and a narrative, so it is important to distinguish the difference between these um, these factors and the, the contributors, and keep them all um, in your your equation to be able to understand what you can do. Otherwise, I mean, there are major things that we can do within our territories by changes of, of lots of patterns, we can still make, make an impact. So New York City cannot wait for the whole globe to address the emission problems and, 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 and mitigate climate change if, if it wants to, um, if it wants to solve the issue or, or adapt itself to climate change. It also needs to understand you know, or, or look at itself and question itself why we have done development in this area and that area, what is going to happen to people living in basements, what happens, what's going to happen with, uh, with urban floods and sea level rise and so on. So it is important to distinguish the difference between these elements. 
will come up with solutions, will come up with some sort of interventions with, which prolong the life of humans on the planet. But, but at, you know, any solution we come up with would not be free of unintended consequences. We have, you know, the, the problems we're dealing with today, many of them are the side products of the, pro the solutions that we have implemented in the past to address some of the problems in, in, in the past. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, humans would, ex you know, as long as we are on this planet, we would experience the same thing. And the next generation would, will, will, would deal with a lot of problems that we create with goodwill. Um, uh, I hope uh, we would not see major side effects for, with a vaccination solution to, to the pandemic because that would be disastrous. But, but in any case, keeping this in mind, I think we, we, we can del you know, get into some, some more um, complexity, um, you know, complex systems, which is my area of work. So, so we are in the fourth industrial revolution. Three in industrial revolutions have gone uh, past, and, and then we have seen a lot of problems. Now we're in the fourth one. The fourth one is, is making us very, you know, we think very, we are, we are very smart because we can compute very rapidly. Like within seconds, we can compute. Lots of the things that we can do on our cell phones or like smart watches uh, are, are now like, you know, beyond what we could do with our computers uh, when we were like doing, I don't know, get, uh, getting our, our, writing our dissertation and, and doing our PhD research. Um, big data. Uh, AI and all of these things, with, with them you can do a lot, chat, GBT and all, but these are just examples, simple examples of how you can be manipulative, um, like you may, can manipulate minds or like even create false correlation between uh, irrelevant um, variables, but it's, it's, it's powerful. And with this power, we have got a lot of things done. You, you kept your connection alive through the years of the pandemic, through so, you know, online gathering, and this became feasible because of this, this, this revolution. But that doesn't mean that this revolution would make us smarter necessarily, because the power to compute and the power to measure, now that we have satellites everywhere, we can remotely sense a lot of things, doesn't mean that we're smarter and we understand systems better. The, the power to measure, the power to, to, to monitor doesn't mean that we understand our systems better. And that's an important thing. When we were concluding the UN Water Conference, everyone kept talking about data. A lot of heads of delegations, a lot of delegation representatives talked about the need for more work on data. Data, data is the new buzzword in, in the policy world. But data on itself doesn't mean more wisdom and, 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 and insight. Data can, can even, I mean, be destructive sometimes because if you have too much data, people can end up with, with their own conspiracy theories as we saw in the, in, in, during the pandemic. So the process of converting data to information and wisdom and insight is also requires us to dig deeper and go into causalities, understanding the relationship between different variables. Otherwise, we end, will end up with conspiracy theories and, and false understanding of what is happening. Unfortunately, in academia, we are seeing more of that. Like, you know, I'm sitting here in my ivory tower in North America and run this global model and then come up with stories about the rest of the world without really understanding what the ground truth is. One example is, yes, uh, you know, at the time that the Syrian crisis started, there was, you know, that was an uh, after a big drought. But doesn't that doesn't mean that the drought was the cause of that event? If you ask the machine, um, it might, you know, tell you that the correlation is strong. But this doesn't mean that there is causality there, and that's that's um, something very important. We are dealing with systems that are complex. Human nature systems are complex. Uh, each of these systems on its own was complex, environment or nature. And, and then human systems are complex. You combine the two, they, they become more com um, complex. Um, I talk about water, I talked about food, I talked about energy and climate and environment, so we, and we talk about the nexus of these. But still these are a small component of a much larger system that involves, like, you know, it has also other 
complex system. So we're essentially dealing with some sort of a system of systems. Each, each sector itself is a very, very complex system. And, and all of these are interlinked. All of these are, are interconnected. You, you press a button somewhere, there is an effect somewhere else. We saw this. And then it becomes unsolvable. Uh, people are dying. Stay at home. Shut it down. We, you know, people are staying at home. Economy is failing. Send people out. Now people are dying. Pressure on the health sector. What? So, so, and and now still we are de dealing with the consequences of that situation. No one still knows what the best best sequence of actions would have been, and what the best timing for taking actions and decisions would have been. Countries had different initial conditions and different boundary conditions and implemented different policies. It's really hard to, 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 to really compare. And yet we don't have a, an instruction of what was, was good. But something was global. We realized that at the time that our health was pro you know, ha ha had problems and we were at the risk of death, uh, we didn't care about the environment. The world stopped talking about climate change and the environment and so on. I remember at the beginning when, when, when it had started, I remember reading op-eds in The Guardian and some leading papers written by climate activists and, and, and some environmental activists blaming the international media why it's paying so much attention to this flu-like you know, disease that is not killing more people than air pollution. So they were saying that by get paying more attention to this problem of the global south and China and east, we are you know, marginalizing the climate and environmental discussions. This is, this, these are the things written by the rich um, in, 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 in countries that where we have the bandwidth to think about 50 years from now. We don't have to think about what we are eating tonight and what our children are going to eat tonight. We, we, don't, ha we don't have to worry about our shelter, shelter and other matters. But what we saw was that at the global level, after, after this came you know, to the West, after then you know, Europe and, and North America got, got into it, then no, one's, no one talked about the environment. And that is, that is a fact. We have to understand why, why a lot of people cannot think about the environment, why a lot of policymakers and nations don't care about the environment, or if they care, they cannot take action on it at the moment because they're dealing with a lot of things. And by the way, one, there is one important thing you need to understand here, a, a definition of complex problem. In, in, in complexity science, in system science, we, we have we distinguish between a problem that is complex and a problem that is complicated. Pandemic. So dealing with the pandemic was a complex problem. You, you fix something, something else pops out. And you fix another thing, something else happens. Because by definition, complex problems don't have a solution. Complicated problem was to find a vaccine. You get the you know resources together. You bring the brains together. Eventually, you find a solution, right? It's it's like the recipe of a steak or a recipe of something else. It's complicated. You you eventually do something, but providing food to a nation is a complex problem. So it's it's very hard to to understand how much, how self sufficient should 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 we be? Which countries shall we rely on? How much we should we rely on the international market? What is the fair price? And so many other things. By definition, these problems don't have a solution. And actually, well, all we can do is navigating through complexity and making sure that we, we cannot, we don't create additional problems by solving one problem. And this is very hard to explain. Imagine me going to media and explain to, to the world that there is no solution. You know, climate change is part of the complexity, and then, or the pandemic is a complex problem, and we cannot really solve this. Yes, you might stay at home, but you might lose your job. So you'd be alive, but you might be starving. Um, you know, so so they don't like that. They like you know a, a simple explanation of of a problem and a solution. Decision makers are the same. They have four years, five years, whatever in, in the office, and they cannot w wait for our you know scientists like us to go in and say. We don't know. By the end of the century, temperature might be one of these. It's not going to work that way. I'm not going to gamble. I'm not going to make you know bet on something that is 
is, is so uncertain. So uncertainty is not welcomed in, in, in decision-making circles. And the society really doesn't like um, uncertainty. And we as scientists want to be honest and we want to communicate uncertainty. And that is, that is the problem that we're having. That's why the conspiracy theorists win in these games over us because they, they have a simple explanation for everything and we don't. In this complex system, our, our job is to navigate through complexity to make sure that the, the, see, the actions we're taking hopefully have the minimal, minimal negative impact down the road and, and you know, don't cause a lot of irreversible damages. That must be our job, unfortunately, and it's really hard. Another thing we need to understand in this game, I'm a game theorist, I explain to my students always that, remember, behind every bad decision, there is a good reasoning. Someone had a reason for that. Uh, yes, it's easy to imagine that everyone is irrational, right? Farmers are irrational, political leaders are irrational, decision makers are irrational, company owners are irrational, we're dying, you know, no one is taking action, everyone is irrational. That's a, you know, way of, of looking at the world. The other way is like everyone is rational on, you know, himself or herself or themselves. So everyone has a rule and a logic and a reward system and a utility function. If you want to address the world's problems, your job is to go and find out the good reasons behind those bad decisions, the decisions that you perceive as bad or negative. If you want to change the attitude, you have to dig deeper and understand why people are making those decisions. And if you do that, you realize that if you are in the shoes of the farmers, you'll keep farm, you know, pumping your groundwater also. And I've done that a lot of times with students with games. When I, I play games with students, they become farmers, and we're like, you know, on, in our online game, um, they're pumping groundwater, sharing groundwater, some surface water, and I'm the god I rain for them sometimes, and sometimes I don't rain. And, 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 and then when, as soon as I say the pro their profit in, in this game is their assignment grade, they become the most selfish people on the planet. And these are the people who 10 minutes earlier were lecturing for us about sustainability and so on. So you put them in those situations and they realize that the institutions sometimes dictate this, this, you know, this situation. Talk is cheap and I included my photo there because I was one of those. And I, I, I have been, you know, we go to meetings, we make promises, empty promises, and we want, you know, ambitious targets are set. No one talks about the pathway to change. We are, you know, we have no shortage of projections of what can happen by 2050s, 2100, and so on, climate related. Still remember, like, uh, you know, none of those projections included the pandemic, really. Uh, so that shows how much we don't know. But, but we don't talk about the pathway to that change. How do we do it? Yes, it's easy to say, stop using fossil fuels and, and use renewables and change the energy price. Stop farming in the, these areas and import food from somewhere else and the problem would be solved. But the markets don't, don't follow and a lot of things are not like that. So that brings us to, to another thing. That's the first paper, I, one of the first, I think the most important or first paper I, 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 I wrote after politics. Um, and that was about like, you know, I wanted to think about how, how policymakers prioritize problems because you have a few years and you have lots of problems. If you're you know, in a developing world, more problems. But even in the, in the, you know, in the global north, lots of problems. Short time, short, short insufficient resources, then how do you prioritize things? I, I use the Eisenhower matrix to explain the situation. If you, you know, tweaked it a little bit, um, everything is based on relative importance and relative urgency. You can use this, by the way, for your daily um, decisions or like, you know. Um, but so you, you, if, if something is, doesn't, doesn't, is not both very important and very urgent, you somehow delay like you know action on it. So let's plan for this. We're going to prepare for it. Let's have a contingency plan and, and you know some sort of adaptation you know plan in, in place. And we keep talking about it or delegate it, give it to someone else, or take no action. Climate change, despite all the things we have talked about, most of the time for the society, 
not like you know as a whole not the younger generation not people it's something that we consider important right uh, we're talking about society not the the scientist community uh, relatively important relatively maybe um, urgent but not the most urgent thing and it's not the most important thing it is if I have a house and I have no problem with income and I have my food and all of that I can't think about 50 years from now but if I'm starving, if I'm in the middle of a war, I can't think about those things, and it's it's a different game for me. So 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 for this to become both urgent, very urgent, and very important, unfortunately, we rely on extreme events. So there's a wildfire, there's a flood, there's a major drought, then we we talk about this. And as I said, even sometimes our narratives are wrong because we blame everything on climate change. That could, you know, maybe the water shortage is because you didn't uh, do your reservoir operation properly. But but it's a good opportunity to get attention to an extreme event. And that is what happens in 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 policymaking. The cost of the political cost of big decisions drop during extreme events. So, so then a lot of politicians are willing to make those changes and some reforms become feasible and possible that cannot be implemented at any other time. The reforms re related to energy were possible in Germany under the pressure of Russia and the same were not applicable before. How come this a nation that could save, I don't know, 20% or more during one year Never, never worked on energy consumption reduction, and it, it worked a lot on supply increase, but not on energy consumption reduction. You shut down nuclear, you shut down this and that and that, but not, not coal and, and so on, but not energy consumption reduction. So that is feasible, but only when you're under pressure, because increasing the prices makes sense. It, you get the society ready, and lots of things, things happen. The other problem, you know, the problem with climate change is, except for those episodes where there is some attention, the, pro the other problem is like we, we don't know. The uncertainty is huge, so we don't know when the tipping point is. We don't know like how, what the limit is. And if I don't know the limit, I have four years in office. I'm not going to make the craziest changes and the craziest reforms because those are very costly politically. And politicians are smart, by the way. We can call them irrational. They're there in office, and their biggest win is to stay there longer, stay in the business longer. They don't come in office to make that big decision for the humanities. If they do, they have a very short life, right? You, they don't either get elected at the first place, or, or if they come, they have a short, short lifespan. So, so lack of the tipping point and this huge uncertainty that we have about what's going to happen tomorrow and, and the day after tomorrow makes decision making harder. Environment is the same thing. You know, maybe we have talked a lot about climate change, but not much about environment. Water, which is my world, what, you know, what I dedicated my career to, is the same thing. It's never the most important thing. Compare it with the pandemic. The pandemic was clearly both very urgent and very important because it was killing people. We lost loved ones. I lost my grandfather. I lost cousins, vaccinated or not vaccinated. They're gone, and, and you see death. Death is real. People are dying. Even the environmentalists, even those who wrote those articles, probably tried to get vaccinated. They, they were not willing to die for the planet. It's helpful, right? You can argue, but they didn't because humans want to survive. We try hard to survive and, and, and we are selfish. We are self-oriented. All the things we are talking about, the planet would, would, would exist without us. We, we, we want to exist longer. But this is the situation we had about the pandemic, which doesn't exist in other situations. We can get, we create a window of opportunity after every disaster. But then the water disasters are very strange. So you have a flood and immediately after you have a drought. So solutions are different, the stories are different, everything. And so you jump from one extreme to another, one problem to another, one crisis to another. And that's why the society can't even have the, the, the general expectation or one expectation from the policymakers to do things on a certain thing, climate change, water, environment, and other things. Um, and it's the same for, for other, other sectors. Extreme events, fortunately and unfortunately, are increasing. 
both in number and in intensity and frequency. And, 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 and so, so they might help, but, but again, the tipping point is unclear and we don't know when we are going to get to that point. And this is, again, very scary and very disappointing. By the time that we, we might be convinced that action is necessary, both on mitigation and adaptation, it might be already too late. In, those, in that case, that bad day, again, the rich might get, get away because they have a bigger capacity, they have a strong, b bigger resilience, but the poor of the world are, are the losers. Now, as scientists, uh, we have to you know, understand, and, and as I said, the incentive system, these complexity that exists, market, politics, and all those you know, justifications behind decisions. Otherwise, we, we always have this issue of we as scientists thinking that we're the brain, we're the smart ones, and those guys don't understand. They're emotional, they're like, you know, they're not making decisions based on their brain. I have worked on both sides. Believe me, like when you go to the other side, you think about, you know, the same thing about the environment, the, 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 the scientists who don't really use their brain. Um, they might have smart computers, but that doesn't mean that they understand the system well, and they, they might miss a lot of details about how decisions are being made and what, what, um, what the cost of the decisions are. If we fall in this trap of thinking we, one, one side is better than the other side, we can, we can make a, a good decision. Now, when it comes to human security and the bandwidth to take action on on climate change, on water resources, on environmental matters, it's good to to remember, you know, a, a simple a simple uh, curve essentially that was initially created to explain probably inequalities, but others took it out to to talk about the environment with it. Um, whether it's right or not, right, right, wrong, still hard to prove, uh, but it's it's a, it's a powerful way of seeing things. So countries. All may, may, most nations started with their like agricultural development phase. So in many many places, like I forget the the newer nations or um, you know some countries that were outliers, but most countries went through that sort of an agricultural revolution. And you know look at the industrial revolutions and so on. So as as you you grow, your your economy is is growing your impact on the environment increases. So that's even the first stage. You're doing agriculture, but with agriculture also you're damaging the environment. So your pollution would be um, increasing. That's the scale effect. So you, you grow bigger, your, your impact is, is, is worse. Then it was the industrializ industrialization phase. So a lot of like a stronger economies reduced their pressure on, on, on their natural resources. They got into industry. Um, industrial products were more expensive, so you could sell them, and as I said, you could trade them, right? Buy the cheap stuff, sell the most expensive one. This, this, is, this is more productive, this is, this is more efficient economically. Still though, the growth continued, so, so pollution, more pollution um, continued. So, but then at some point, at some point, technology helped us with better efficiency. And with, with not only that, we also were able in many countries to reduce the, you know, to invest in cleaner sectors and service sectors, right? To the things that were too, too polluting um, were, were, were sent to the other places. Like we assembled, you know, we, we created assembly lines here, but like, you know, the, the dirt and the, the pollution was left over again for the global south in many cases. We're even doing that with electric cars, by the way. So, so then the tipping point is, is possible. Some people, some countries have, have, have got, got there and some people, some countries are in the process. So, so kind of the, the um, reducing the pressure of your economy on natural resources becomes feasible with more wealth more income and better, you know, further economic development. Now, once that, that happens, then you, you can be hopeful that increased GDP doesn't necessarily mean increased pollution. That doesn't mean that, you know, not all, every country in the world is in, in the green zone of this, this curve. Even many countries in the global north are not in the green zone of that curve. So, the issue is that they, they're still trying to deal with some other problems. Now, if you're a country under sanctions, if you're a country in a war, if you're a country in, 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 in um, 
in, in a conflict and, and so on. You can't really spend money or like don't have the bandwidth to go toward more industrialization or greening your economy and, and invest in, investment in the green sector. What happens is that a lot of your resources would be dedicated to deal with this conflict sanctions and so on. You become even more resource exhaustive. You, you, you sell raw material to just create jobs, to pay, pay people or bribe people so they sh ma shut their mouth up. So in that situation, you can't really get to that tipping point and you'll continue that. And I'll, I'd like to share personal stories with, with you. This is, you know, one of the ministers of Afghanistan, the former government. And I remember at the time of the pandemic, I was talking to him. I wanted to, you know, understand what the situation is. And in a lot of cases, I, I you know, I, I had interactions with him, like we were negotiating over transboundary systems with each other. Very smart man. I, but I remember when we were talking, talk, I was talking to him about the pandemic. His situation was, was different. And he said, yes, we don't have much pollution. The bir birds are singing, but people are fighting over like bread and, and other things because we can't afford, like not only we can't va vaccinate them, but we don't have food and other things. And, you know, who cares in that situation about the birds? And now think about Afghanistan now that is even worse when, when women are, you know, not, not having their rights. And another experience was with the deputy minister of environment of Yemen. And, and the same conversation, you know, we were, we were th thinking why the world doesn't understand the situation there. Well, how can you expect the Yemeni minister uh, to think about the cli climate change and other things in the middle of a war? And he was telling me that he has written a letter about like, you know, one endemic tree that, that in the war zone that, you know, w the, the fighters were, were burning and people were laughing at him because for the, you know, even the ministry for the last six months, they were not able to pay the salaries and so on. A country that is in that situation cannot, cannot think about some of these environmental problems that we are thinking about. So if we are the rich of the world and we are not willing to change our lifestyle, how can we expect them? Now the problem, to, to change behavior, the problem though is, is that the environmental security problem issue, the human security issues, um, triggered by envir environmental problems are becoming more attractive to the intelligence, defense community, journalists, and so on. But what we are suffering from is the issue of linear thinking. In natural science, engineering, and everything, we are trained to think linearly. Uh, they tell us what the problem is, and you know, so present situation, what it, we want it to be like, so that defines our problem. We come up with a decision to alter the environment, and that's you know, done, outcome. But that's what we did, and, and, and that resulted in all these unintended consequences of the previous revolutions. Um, same applies to environmental problems. We think about climate change, we think about environmental degradation, all, all these things, and then we say there are security impacts, human security issues, right? But I just talked to you, I, I shared with you the examples of Afghanistan, Yemen, um, and, and of other countries. Is it only like this side that we should care about or there are other things that we think uh, we, we, we need to care about. As a person coming from the global south, as a person who has functioned in the global south in, in, a, you know, in a high level policy position, I say there is another side of this game. One of the reasons that the environment is degrading in many of these countries is because of human insecurity issues, because of inequality issues, because the system dis is dysfunctional, because of corruption and, and, and so on. So those countries don't, can't even think about the environment. So if you're only seeing the red connection here, then your solutions I'm sorry, would be stupid because you think you go there and fix the environment and everything is, is fixed without thinking about the whole system and the complexity that is there and the connection between the two. So for, for that Yemeni deputy minister, the, the blue side of the game was probably more important and that is missed a lot of times by our journalists, by people in the global north and by a lot of analysts of, of human you know, environmental related human security problem. That's something we have to think about. We have to think non-linearly about loops, a reinforcing loop that is actually much more, much scarier and more frustrating than the, the simple cause and effect um, link that we keep talking about. 
Because if you don't think that way, and I'm going to end you know, my, 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 with a few more slides, but the, the, the major part of the discussion would be over soon with an example, again, from Afghanistan, that, you know, that sort of a one-side thinking, you know, cause and effect thinking and linear thinking resulted in uh, some development agencies or good, you know, uh, foundations or NGOs with goodwill uh, good intentions to say, okay, we'll we have found a sustainable solution for, for farming, and that's solar pumping. So they went to Afghanistan, gave solar pumps to a lot of farmers. Guess what? The situation became good because you had now have access to water, you, you pump water, you produce more, you produce more, so you sell more, your income goes up. Immediately after this, immediately after this, um, what happened was, first of all, groundwater level, there was a groundwater level drawdown because that, then every farmer got affected. Groundwater level when it went down, it affected surface water flow toward the neighboring country, more conflicts with that. It affected one, you know, shared ecosystem there, has implications for that. Again, dust storms from a wetland affected both sides of the water. But the other thing which w became clear through satellite um, image processing was, was, you know, was, was, it was a, another thing which was discovered by, by a company in the West. That, that was a question of like, what do these guys grow, by the way? <laughs> it was poppy. So, so as a result of this sustainable solar-based solution, there was no shortage of heroin for, for a long time in Europe, <laughs> right? So everyone could remain high and happy, but while while in Afghanistan, despite all the you know, shortages of water and, and droughts and, and, and all, all of that, there was a steady growth in, in you know, poppy production. So Afga Afghans keep suffering while you know, we, we might be partying. So, so this is the issue of not understanding that these things are related. Now, you cannot say that solar pumps are bad. You cannot say that giving solar, you know, giving Energy access to the farmers is bad, but if you don't think about everything, then you implement a solution that is not complete. It has technology, it's smart, it looks sustainable, but then you have big failures that can affect you. So your, your smart solution would be garbage. And that is something you have to understand. And, and another thing is, your smart solution out of academia might be garbage to a policymaker for the same same reasons, because a lot of times we, we establish arbitrary boundaries and, and we set boundary, boundaries that don't exist in reality. So I'm dealing with a water system uh, that to me is, is ju just hydrologic, but to, to, some, to a politician, hydrology is just part of a small component of, of a system and other things matter. The other issue is that a lot of times we are fighting over different you know, narratives, even though we are promoting the same thing, we are caring about the same thing. With social media, this is even getting worse. And, and listening to people and communicating to people is becoming harder. So when I was at Imperial College before politics, I was one of those who you know, kept talking to the policymakers, talking with them, trying to talk about the policy implications of things. And science policy gap was very important to me, and I, I, I thought I'm doing well. When I went into, went in, into politics, actually, I realized that, that sometimes, e even though I had power to make changes, sometimes I was getting resistance even from environmental activists when I was making some decisions. And that was the problem of communication. Me, after, after, after politics and, and policy making, it, 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 thinking also about that, that, that you know, connection, unless you talk, unless you talk to, the, to, to both policymakers and society, you cannot increase the you know, pressure weight on the shoulders of the policymakers to make a change properly, the way that satisfies um, uh, both sides. So we have to start communicating more, have a better understanding of, of the society, and I think stop being arrogant and thinking that we know it all, because we don't. And, and it's okay to, to deal with unsolvable problems, but that's the first rule. If you understand that you know, raising a kid is a complex problem and not a complicated problem, you, rely, you realize that you know, the, the, the path has a lot of uncertainties and a lot of things that are out of your control. The many other things are the, are the same thing. There are complex problems that we don't have a solution for, but still we have to fight, think through, 
and, and deal with this complexity in a, in a good way. Thank you for listening to me. Sure, absolutely, yes. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Just note that the reception, <laughs> if you want to go to the reception, you should ask questions. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. I'm ready to tell. Many thanks. Congratulations for your presentation. It has been brilliant and, and uh, alarming at the same time. Uh, one question. What is your appraisal of the conclusions of the United Nations Water, Con Water Conference, which has taken place very recently? A stupid solutions, as you said, quick fixes. Is, is this what you expected? Um. So a, a very, very good question, because I, I even have, have seen articles written on, on you know, criticizing this, it, the, the, the conference. I think it, your conclusion depends on your expectation from the conference. Going in as a former person in those games, I, I, I you know, and as the head of a dele I took the delegation, one delegation back, I, I didn't think that we would solve the problems by the end of that, that conference. I knew that, that that conference would not result in anything that would create obligations for, for governments because that was not supposed to, to happen. It was a moment for, for thinking about water. Um, it was, I think, promising in that regard. It sets the stage for, for taking action and, 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 and changing some of the narratives. But if I want to criticize it, is one side is many participants didn't even know how it works. Lots of young participants were there, by the way, that's more, you know, um, on one side, very positive. On the on the you know the other side, uh, might say why they didn't have realistic ex ex expectations. Lots of academics were there. Again, people with not much prior experience of, of these things. Um, but but remember, like sometimes big things might emer might come out come out of these things, and that would be um, if if we. 2015, I don't think we, we knew that Paris would be feasible. And you know, we're in 2023, still we haven't reached the goals that we set, and that was the, also the, the, the concern back then. Uh, but, but the world thinks differently about climate change. So on a positive side, I think this, this event um, was very promising in, in reminding the world that water matters, remind, reminding the member states and the UN that we don't have a strong mechanism for, for, for dealing with water. Um, we have UN water, which is just a coordination mechanism, but we don't have any special, any agency dedicated to water. Um, as a result of that, that we'll, we'll have a special envoy on dealing with water. So the, the, the Secretary General would have that. So that would be a positive step forward. But I don't, unfortunately, uh, expect a lot to happen meaningfully. Another thing is, is that SDG 6, um, you know, it was a moment, a good moment for SDG 6. Uh, we reminded the world, you know, my institute, we published a report on the second day on global water security, first assessment actually done at the global level, showing that we are so off track uh, 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 that, that, that the, you know, the, the lack of progress on SDG 6 can affect the progress on every other thing. So because of these interlinkages, we can really deliver on the SDGs by 2030. We also had a lot of promises and commitments that were made. If you notice, they were like, you know, that was a chance. Again, a lot of empty, ambitious promises, a lack of financial resources, because people keep talking about targets. No one is interested in the pathway. Or few are interested, I should say. OK. Thank you very much for your great presentation. I have a question. I don't know if you are familiar with the position with the new Colombian president, Gustavo Petro, about the global the global problem the, about the weather. So he he and uh, he he tried to be a leader 
in the protection of the uh, the Amazon basin and the water sources in in Latin America, and he's trying to to change the national debt for protection of the uh, uh, Amazon basin. However, there is a, a big opposition of traditional uh, fuel fossil fuel producers. And the, I don't know if you, what is your position? The question is, what is your position about uh, progressive policies in order to protect the environment against the, this, uh, this global economy that try to keep the economy running in the same way? I mean, of course, I, I, I support any sort of you know, progressive action that would benefit humans as a whole. Um, so, so, so I support that, but I, I also care about the injustice elements of it, and 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 some some you know lack of truth and transparency. I give you an, an example of you know what we what is happening with the electric vehicles in the world. I, I drive a, an electric vehicle, so we're we're arguing that that you know for the 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 gasoline based car diesel cars are not good polluting and so on bad for climate change yes okay so we're selling electric cars to people where does lithium come from if you look at what is happening to bolivians i mean a colleague of mine last year in in sweden she she shared some results w with me she said she's afraid of you know she's not willing to share those results outside the room they had gone to the lithium mining area in Bolivia, and and you know high elevation, very hard place to work. Uh, locals, one of the first things they had that lost is access to quinoa because of the price has gone up, and all of a sudden we're very interested in them. Uh, so their you know their local food is gone; it's unaffordable for them. Um, she says, like we see the the the, the pollution level. And then we compare it with the WHO standards. My hypothesis is that this place is a lot, you know, you have, we have to see a lot of cancer. She was showing to me, like, when they did the analysis, like, these bodies had transformed, essentially. They were not similar to other humans that they had studied, first of all. So, so as a result, there was no cancer. So no cancer record. Wow, that's interesting. But life expectancy is 40 years. People die before they develop cancer. Now tell me that this is a fair solution. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but we have one side that is interested in fossil fuel profit. We know that that is there and it's clear. There is another side which also has profit and doesn't care about what happens to it. So we might be taking pressure from the Middle East to, to South America or other poor nations. So again, we create these things. Now, when I, I come from Iran, right? Um, we we see like some climate activists keep talking about oh these ten companies in the world twenty companies in the world make this much of the GDP of the world at the expense of climate change for the rest of the nation. Then I look at the list: Iran oil company, Iraq oil company, Venezuela. Hey, what is the condition for these people? Look at their nations. What are they? You know what is their gain? What was their gain of this? I mean, dictatorship in any many places, pollution, salutes, you know, pollution, polluted oil, polluted soil, polluted air, cancer, all of those problems, injustice is is there, and and other nations have made progress, and and then now you're saying you have to stop doing, you know, stop um, extracting oil, and you should pay for it. This is the problem that like the the injustice element blocks a lot of things. I was the lead negotiator. I was I was fighting for for this, and I was trying to to get the parliament ratify the agreement. But but it was hard for me, you know, that every every bad decision has a has a has a good good reason. I had to respect that they're thinking about so many other elements. And just because a lot of times you don't think the game is fair, you say no to something that is a common good. We know this is a good solution for all of us. But it's not fair. My share of this is not fair. I teach game theory. Say, I have to this student, I have $1 in my pocket. You have $19. There is that cake that we're both dying to eat. And it's, co it's cost us $20. If we don't put our money together, we, w you know, we won't have that cake. Okay? We, well, we won't get How much of that cake are you willing to give 
to me. I want 50%. Most of them say no, because it's an unfair solution, right? But we both lose as a result of that. A lot of times it's, a, it's a, this case. So, so Brazilians, when they come to the climate change negotiations, the question is, is Amazon their good or it's a global good? So then it's like, okay, don't touch that because it's, it belongs to, the, to the all, all humans and we're not going to pay you. It's just our natural capital, which happens to be in your country, right? But then here we are not changing lifestyle and attitude. So the issue is we, we have to be careful about becoming reductionist and not thinking about other market forces, political forces, and, and so on, and the unfairness. Justice is something that we have to fight for. And I think we all can do you know, a bit of that as, as, as scientists. We have to care about what, what's going to happen um, to the poor as a result, result of the, the, these changes. And consumerism is a major cause of a lot of these environmental problems. Still, we measure success of the nations with GDP. Production, increased production means success. Increased production, to get there, you need increased consumption, right? So, so we have Amazon and others that encourage you to use like to buy a lot of unnecessary things and they, you get addicted to a lot of these things because they have to sell. They tell you that they're reducing their consumption here and there or like their, their, their footprint here and there. But that doesn't mean that as a whole, everything is getting better. So, so th that is something, the hypocrisy that we have to be careful about. Of course, anything which helps the world and is fair to all, I support. But that thing probably doesn't exist. So we have to go through baby steps for improvement. Put your hands together for him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Splendid, magnificent.